Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Wednesday's episode of C-SPAN. My name is Megan, and we're live in our wetlands dome today with a special and awesome biologist, Matt, who's going to give us a tour of our wetlands and learn about all the reptiles that live in our wetlands dome. How's it going, guys? So you guys are right now in front of our alligator exhibit. And in here, we have two American alligators and an alligator snapping turtle. And in front of you right now is blue. So we have blue and white. They are both female American alligators and they are each 17 years old and weigh 150 pounds. Now, when it comes to telling females and males apart, when it comes to alligators, it is much easier when you uh, see them as adults because females will only get about six to eight feet and males can get 10 to 12 feet on average. Now, the, uh, the record here in Florida right now for a male alligator is about 15 feet and a thousand pounds. So alligators can get very large, but these two girls are full grown and they probably won't grow too much anymore because alligators do grow throughout their entire lifetime. But when it comes to alligators, they will grow much quicker until they reach six feet. So a lot of people always like to ask us, how fast do alligators grow? And usually the answer that you will get is that an alligator will grow about a foot a year until they reach six feet. Now, once a female reaches six feet, they will slow down growing a lot more drastically than the males do, because like I said, the males do get larger than the females. Now, we do have Pepper Jack in here as well, and Pepper Jack is our alligator snapping turtle. And Pepper Jack is about 96 pounds. Now, that is pretty big for a turtle because alligator snapping turtles are the largest freshwater turtle in North America but that is nowhere close to the record size of an alligator snapping turtle because the record size is actually 250 pounds. Now we don't suspect that Pepper Jack is going to get that large, but he is still a pretty decent size alligator snapping turtle, especially compared to the female that you will see later on in our little tour. So this is our alligator exhibit, but we are going to move on now and go check out some of the other animals here in the wetlands gallery. And of course, we have to say hi to biologist Megan, who's currently cleaning our otter exhibit. Hi. So while we are closed, we are definitely still uh, doing maintenance, keeping up with the cleanliness of all of our habitats. Uh, so our biologists are here every single day working hard to keep our animals healthy, clean, and happy during this time of closure. All right, so here we do have our Burmese Python exhibit. Now this might not be everyone's favorite exhibit because we are aware that some people do have a slight fear of snakes, but Sarah is definitely a sweetheart. So Sarah is 13 feet, one inch long, and she does come in at about 86 pounds. Now you guys probably aren't gonna see Sarah move around too much today, and that is because she just got fed yesterday. Now we do get this question quite commonly, what do we feed our uh, Burmese pythons here at the aquarium? And first things first is they get fed this exact same way everything else gets fed here at the aquarium. Their food does come in frozen and we just thaw it out and bring it up to room temperature. So Sarah does eat about six pounds of rabbit once a month. So it is something, um, that we are actually gonna be doing on exhibit in the future. So we will make signs and let you guys see that if you want to, but we are well aware that not everyone wants to see something like that. But a lot of the reason why people are scared of these snakes, unfortunately, is due to media and movies. And one thing that I always like to talk to people about is when it comes to snakes, why are you scared? What is going on? There's a lot of studies about them trying to figure out why people are afraid. What's interesting about these studies is about it's about 50-50. It's 50% people are taught that when they're young to be a little bit afraid of them. And there's 50% that people are just naturally afraid of these animals. But if you get to know them, they are really cool and interesting animals and very important. One of the biggest issues facing um, our ecosystem right now is the Burmese pythons. Now, a lot of people think this is a new issue, but they've actually been here since the 1970s. Um, they got brought here due to the pet trade. A lot of people thought that this was a good snake to have as a pet, but unfortunately they didn't realize uh, what was 
what would all go into taking care of this animal. So just like some people like to have big dogs and some people like to have small dogs, some people like to have big reptiles as pets and some people like to have small reptiles as pets. And if you wanted a big reptile, this was the perfect one to get because Burmese pythons are in the top six largest snakes in the world, but they're not the largest. In fact, reticulated pythons are the largest species of snake in the world. They get the longest at a rec and the record size right now belongs to a snake named Medusa at 25 feet 2 inches. Now that might come a little bit confusing to some people because a lot of people think the anacondas are the biggest snakes, but the anacondas are the heaviest snakes. So reticulated pythons are the longest, anacondas are the heaviest. Now, like I said, this was the perfect large snake to get because they're very docile. They're known for their quite um, nice demeanor. So like I said, Burmese pythons have been here since the 1970s. And one thing to realize is that since the 1970s, since they've been here, there's been no incidents of them attacking a person unless provoked which pretty much means if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. It's the same case if you were to go outside right now and you try to go hug a squirrel, do you think that squirrel's gonna hug you back? No, it's probably gonna bite you. So just leave the pythons alone and they'll leave you alone. So I do really like working with Sarah. A lot of that has to do with the fact that she is misunderstood. And like I said, it goes back to those movies and uh, films. Because if you think about it, there's such films as Anaconda, Crocaconda, Six-Headed Shark, things like that. But have you guys ever seen Puppyzilla? No, there's no such thing as Puppyzilla. We just make it out to be that snakes are these mean animals. And unfortunately, herpetologists like myself, we sometimes don't help them out because we really enjoy these animals. So sometimes we take pictures when they are in a defensive posture with their mouth open, because that's a cool picture. But do you guys take pictures of your puppies with their mouth open, growling and snarling? No, you usually take pictures of them frolicking in flowers and things like that. So we make these animals out to be villains when we really shouldn't because they are very important. Over in Southeast Asia, where they're uh, supposed to be, they help out by eating a lot of rodent populations. And unfortunately, because they're not in that area too much anymore, We've seen rodent issues go up. Rodents eat our homes, eat our food, and they bring really bad disease. So we need these animals around to help out with that. So Sarah, even though she's not moving around too much, she is a really cool animal. Alrighty, let's go on over to another part of the wetlands. And Matt, I think it's important to call to attention that Burmese pythons are an invasive species in Florida, and that is a big issue because they don't have natural predators, right? Exactly. So Burmese pythons are an apex predator. So what a lot of people don't realize about this is that Burmese pythons lay anywhere from about 20 to 80 eggs at a time. And they can actually double clutch in a season, meaning that they lay upwards to 160 eggs. But the reason why this animal does this is because if you have 80 babies, maybe about five to six of those are actually gonna reach adulthood because a 13 foot snake does not give birth to a 13 foot snake. It gives birth to a snake that's only about six to eight inches long. So a lot of things do eat Burmese pythons when they're little, but as they get bigger, there's really not much going after them. So that's one of the biggest issues that we face because at the same time too, if you are a very large animal, that means you have the capability of eating a wide variety of animals. So we do know that the Burmese pythons are affecting um, a lot of different local fauna down here. More importantly, we know that they've affected the marsh rabbit population. And this is really important to realize because as we know, rabbits are known for their breeding abilities. And if they can affect rabbit populations, they can definitely continue to cause harm in some other ways. But even with that all being said, I always want to end with the fact that it's not the Burmese pythons fault they're here. And we shouldn't criticize that animal, even though it is um, a big issue that they're causing. Now, we are here in front of our rat snake enclosure. And right now you can see two of the snakes um, very apparently, but we do have five in here. So we have a gray rat snake, a yellow rat snake, and then we actually have three red rat snakes and what's really cool about them unfortunately they're kind of tucked away in the back there is that even though they're all red rat snakes they're all different color morphs so actually we have what is referred to as a normal phase red rat snake which you'll find here in florida 
We have an Okiti or Okiti uh, phase, which is a color that you'll find up in North Carolina. And then we actually have a designer morph rat snake in here called a snow, which is actually all white. And the reason why we have the variety of different rat snakes in here is because we wanted to show you guys why the reptile pet industry is booming as of late. A lot of people don't realize this, but you can actually breed these snakes for these specific colors. So just like dogs are all um, the same species, but they come in different breeds, you will get rat snakes or ball pythons, which are even more popular, that will be in different colors and dependent on the color that you get, actually will raise the retail price of that animal. So ball pythons, which you can find at your local pet store, can actually uh, come in over 350 different colors. And the highest priced one on the market today is about $20,000. This is a very lucrative market. So that's why we definitely encourage people to uh, get reptiles as pets as long as you're a responsible owner. So when it comes to these guys, just make sure that you have the availability to take care of them for their entire lifetime and make sure you have the space requirement. Burmese pythons, that was one of the biggest issues. If you have a two bedroom apartment, that Burmese python is getting the other bedroom at some point and you have to be okay with that. So this is our uh, rat snake enclosure. Definitely um, when you're in front of this enclosure, see if you can find all five of them and see if you can uh, see the different color ones in here because they are definitely um, really cool and a lot of people just aren't aware of the different color morphs that you can find on the market. All right, awesome. So Matt, what are we gonna do up next? All right guys, so what we're actually gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and feed our juvenile alligators. Um, so they get fed five times a week because like we said earlier, they are still growing. Um, so they get fed five times a week, whereas our adults only get fed three times a week. So we shoot to feed them about three to four percent of their body weight in a week, whereas the adults actually only get fed about one percent of their body weight in a week. So I'm going to go ahead and get set up with that and we'll be right back with you. Yeah, guys, so we're going to be feeding this habitat full of our baby alligators. And you'll notice a lot of these guys hanging out together and basking over a nice heat lamp. But while Matt is setting up, let's go over to our brown pelicans and say good morning. Hi guys. So this is Theo and Josh and they're shaking out their feathers right now. Uh, Theo is on the left and Josh is on the right. Uh, you can see Theo has his juvenile feathers. He's a lot more gray than Josh and Josh you can see has that brown head, which denotes that he is an adult brown pelican. And these guys uh, hang out together in this habitat. And they're so cute and fun to watch. They definitely have been missing all of you guys while we have been closed. All right, let's check back in on Matt and see if we can feed some of these gators. Alrighty guys, so we are doing this a little bit earlier than we normally do, which is completely okay. It's nice to kind of switch things up on the animals a little bit. So in here we do have 10 juvenile alligators. In fact, we got them last June. And when we got them, they were only about 300 grams. Now I actually just weighed these guys the other day and some of them are upwards to 2,500 grams, which is about eight times the size of when we got them. So. Like we said earlier, they do grow a lot when they're younger. Sometimes they get a little over eager and want to eat. We'll go ahead and get started then. So just to let you guys know, <laughs> these guys, like I said, get fed five times a week. Two of the days they get offered a crocodilian biscuit. That's that brown pellet you'll see us feeding out every now and then. So just like your dogs get fed a dry food diet, someone actually made a dry food diet for alligators and they call it crocodilian um, biscuit and pretty much what it is it's 90% pork and the rest is all uh, good vitamins that they need um, and nutrients so we'll feed that two times a week uh, the other two days they will get offered some fish and then the one day a week they'll get offered rodent so today like I said we are going to be feeding out some small mice so just for all of those that weren't here earlier all of our food does come in frozen. We just thaw it out, bring it up to room temperature, just like everything else. 
The reason why we do that is it allows us to know where we're getting our food items from, make sure that these animals were raised properly so that we can feed them out to our animals and know the nutritional contents of it so everything is vetted through a good system. So when I do this feeding, as you can see, they do get a little eager to want to eat. And a lot of people ask, how do I know everyone's getting enough food? So when it comes to feeding them, I can tell them all apart. They do have little striping and markings to tell the difference between them. But at the same time as well, that's not foolproof. I make mistakes, other people make mistakes, it's only natural. So what we actually have done is that the alligators have a little chip inside them. It's the same type of chip you can put in your dog. Um, it's called a pit tag and pretty much is once a month I'll go into this exhibit, I'll get hands on all the animals, and we'll take them out, we'll scan them, a barcode pops up, tells us who's who, and then I can weigh them, and then go ahead and put their weight on a graph to make sure that they are increasing the way that we want. So that's how we ensure that everyone is eating. If someone is not getting enough food, we will specifically pinpoint that certain individual and try to offer them more. If that is not working on exhibit, we'll then uh, potentially move that animal to another area of the aquarium so we can get them enough food. So that's how we go about feeding these guys. And like I said, they're pretty eager to want to eat, so it's really not too difficult to go about feeding them. Um, and then in this exhibit as well, who's kind of hiding over in the corner, we do have our female alligator snapping turtle. And when I was talking about Pepper Jack over there, I mentioned that pepper jack was 96 pounds. Well, male snapping turtles are the ones that are known for getting really big. Female snapping turtles actually don't get as large as the males do. In fact, they only get up to 50 pounds. So even though um, our female over here is 17 years old as well, she only weighs about 25 pounds, whereas pepper jack is upwards to 96 pounds. And this is kind of like a a theme with some of our reptile species that you see females or males being larger like one sex bigger than the other right matt yeah it all depends on the species that you're talking about so like burmese pythons the females do get larger uh, than the males because they have to be larger to occupy all the eggs and things like that but some species of snakes you'll see the males get bigger like your eastern indigo snakes you'll see the males get bigger because they will uh, have to kind of fight with other males in order for breeding rights. Same thing with the um, cottonmouth or water moccasins that we have down here. The males do get much larger than the females. Now, speaking of cottonmouths and water moccasins, just because uh, we were talking about babies and things like that a second ago, one thing that's always um, kind of interesting for people to hear is a lot of people don't realize this, but some species of reptiles don't lay eggs. Some species of reptiles actually give live birth. So um, the, a lot of the venomous snakes that we have here in Florida actually give live birth. So they don't lay eggs, which is kind of cool. And it's really important to note that American alligators are super important to our Florida ecosystem. At one point, they almost became extinct because people were hunting them, using them for you know, their skins and people didn't like alligators, right Matt? Yeah, so back in the 50s and 60s, alligators were almost hunted to extinction. Like you said, there was a lot of commercial trades that could use alligators. So luckily we did take notice of this. So um, back in 1979, we did put them on the Endangered Species Act. And this is actually the greatest Endangered Species Act success story that we know of today. Because here in Florida, everyone kind of knows we have alligators everywhere. And like we just said, it wasn't like that for a period of time. So um, alligators were down as populations of only a couple of thousand in total. Whereas we have 1.5 million alligators just here in the state of Florida alone. Now, one thing that we always uh, kind of need to give credit for as well as the Endangered Species Act helped out greatly, but one thing that helped out a lot that a lot of people don't actually realize is that alligator farms help bring these animals back as well. So alligator farms do get a bad connotation or you know bad kind of description, but what happened back uh, in the day was that alligator farms would actually grow out a third of their population to get the alligators up to four feet and then release them out into the wild. Because again, just like Burmese pythons, alligators, they lay a lot of eggs. They lay about 20 to 80 eggs at a time. But 
a 10 foot alligator does not give birth to a 10 foot alligator. It gives birth to alligators that are six to eight inches or so that have to grow out. So releasing alligators that were four feet gave that animal a better chance of survival. So alligator farms back in the day used to release a portion of their population. Now, of course, they're not doing that anymore because we have plenty of alligators out there, but it is important to realize that this was a project that a lot of people came together on so we could have these amazing animals because they are a keystone species. And what that means is without alligators around, a lot of animals actually wouldn't survive. One of the ways that alligators help out is that in periods of drought, they'll actually dig down into the ground and create something called a gator hole. And what that is, is pretty much it's just a hole where they found water. A lot of animals can't dig that deep into the ground to find water. So once the alligator rehydrates and soaks itself up, it'll leave that hole and it'll just leave it as it is. So other animals like amphibians, salamanders, frogs will actually jump into that gator hole and rehydrate themselves. So gator holes are definitely something that alligators helped out with. And one of the crazier things that a lot of people don't understand is alligators help out bird populations. And you might think that's kind of weird because don't alligators eat birds? But if you ever go out into the wild and you see a natural bird rookery, which is pretty much where birds will gather together to nest and have their young, you'll always find alligators around for the most part. And that is because even though baby birds are some of the clumsiest animals out there, mom isn't worried about a baby falling out of the nest and being eaten by an alligator. Mom is worried about things like raccoons because a raccoon can go into a bird's nest, eat all the eggs, move on to the next nest, and completely destroy a wild rookery all in one night. But guess what? A raccoon's not gonna try and climb a tree near an alligator because just as much as that alligator would love to eat a baby bird, that alligator would love to eat that raccoon. And the birds know this. So birds rely heavily on alligators and that is why um, you'll see a lot of alligators kind of hanging out where bird rookeries are, which is really kind of cool. And it's important to note guys, if you see an alligator in the wild, just make sure to stay far away from it and leave it alone. Uh, something that's really popular in Florida is people feeding wild alligators. And this is actually super detrimental to people and to animals because if they identify people with food, they're gonna come right up to you and that can be super dangerous for people. So if you see an alligator, just leave it alone and give it its space. Yeah, and it's very true. If you're out hiking, stay on marked trails. Uh, don't kind of venture off. This is the same type of advice we give you if you're worried about snakes. You know, just leave these animals alone. One of the things that you guys kind of witnessed when we came over here is that these alligators are fully aware that I feed them. They came right on over. That is not a natural response. So if you're ever out in the wild, if you're kayaking, canoeing, if an alligator is going away from you, that is naturally what they're supposed to do. If it looks like they're coming towards you, it's probably because they've been fed and you should give that alligator just a little bit more space. Because alligators, they are very intelligent animals, but they don't know the difference between um, these tongs and my hand when it comes to feeding if there's food in it. So just be very careful when it comes to uh, living around these animals because like we said we need them they're incredibly important so under no circumstances you guys try to actually feed an alligator it's actually illegal here in the state of Florida to feed harm or harass an American alligator and that's for your safety alrighty guys so that wraps up our alligator feeding and our tour of our reptiles and our wetlands dome Thank you so much for joining in to today's episode of C-SPAN. And thank you to our C-SPAN sponsor, CIBC. And join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. to see Sophie training some of our stingrays, which will be super fun and exciting. Until tomorrow, everybody, stay current.